everyone loves chocolate, a delectable treat that is always high in demand worldwide. Only the best cocoa beans are used to make fine chocolate. It's no secret that Trinidad and Tobago produces some of the world's best quality cocoa. In this episode of Science for All, we'll reveal the science of Trinidad's fine flavored cocoa. There are two types of cocoa beans that are marketed on the international market. We have bulk and final flavor. Trinidad and Tobago is reputed as an exclusive producer of final flavor uh, beans, and these command a premium price on the international market. Final flavor beans, they are like, they are used to make the Rolls Royce of chocolates. And they are marketed in a very different way to the chocolates made from bulk beans. For example, this is a Cadbury Bonneville bar made from bulk, bulk beans. And final flavor beans are made into chocolates that are marketed very much like wines and cigars. So this is the presentation. It's very, very different. The consumer appreciates the ancillary flavors that are present in the bean, such as fruitiness, floral notes, raisin type notes, even winey notes, as opposed to bulk beans where you just get basic cocoa flavor or chocolate flavor. There's no other place on the face of the earth where you can get this unique and special taste. Yes, they will try to produce flavored cocoa, but not as sweet and not as flavorable as Trinidad's cocoa. Trinidad is very unique in the world of cocoa in that we are the birthplace of Trinitario germplasm. And literally, the word Trinitario means native of Trinidad. In 1727, a natural phenomenon called a blast, whether it was a disease or a hurricane, destroyed almost all of the naturally occurring Criollo material that was grown in Trinidad. And the planters of the day brought in more vigorous forest stereotypes from the Amazon region. And that hybridized naturally with the remnants of the Criollo population to give rise to Trinitario. The production of cocoa was so profitable, it was grown all over Trinidad and it was called King. But in the 1920s, cocoa lost its status. Many factors contributed to the decline of the industry, including diseases and social issues, and the reign of the king ended. The Ministry of Agriculture, Land and Marine Resources and the Cocoa Research Unit, University of the West Indies, collaborate to improve the present stock of Trinidad cocoa. We have over 2,000 accessions of cocoa types conserved at the International Cocoa Gene Bank. And by screening each of these accessions, or at least a core set uh, for flavor attributes, we're able to then combine traits of economically important values such as yield, disease resistance, butterfat, as well as flavor to enhanced germplasm that is then distributed via international quarantine to international breeding programs across the globe. To produce healthy cocoa pods, special care must be taken of the trees. Fields must be kept clean and have adequate drainage. Diseases must be controlled. There are three diseases affecting cocoa, all caused by fungi. Black pod, frosty pod, and witch's broom diseases. These three diseases are all found on the American continent. We have here in Trinidad the black pod and the witch's broom. Frosty pod disease has not yet come to Trinidad. There's a difference in the way in which witch's broom fungus attacks the plant from the other two. In that witch's broom tends to attack the growing points of the plant. The disease can be controlled by pruning. If you cut off the infected, infected parts, then you, in a sense, save the plant. But then the plant is going to produce new shoots and they're still capable or still vulnerable to the disease. So it's a vicious cycle. Not only that, pruning is labor intensive, hence very expensive, 
and it's not really very practical because, as I said, new growth appears and that new growth can be, again, infected. A much better method of control is breeding for resistance. After the pods are picked and cracked and beans separated, the beans are put to be sweated or fermented in wooden sweat boxes covered with banana leaves or jute bags. The first step of the fermentation process is anaerobic. That is, it takes place without the presence of oxygen. The bulk of the sugars in the pulp of the cocoa are converted to alcohol. Because of this, the pulp shrinks. The next step is aerobic and the alcohol is turned into an acid. The testa or coat of the bean gains a dark brown color. When the beans are completely sweated or fermented, they are put to dry. Long ago, specially designed cocoa houses with sliding roofs and flat floors were used for drying the beans. Beans spread across the floor were exposed to heat from the sun. The sliding roofs were easily opened and closed because when there was cocoa drying in the sun, you know that you just had to look out for rain. That could ruin all your hard work. What is important in drying is really drying rate. Because at the end of the fermentation process, you have in the bean accumulated acetic acid. So a gradual drying rate would allow for the migration of the acetic acid out of the bean. If drying occurs too quickly, you would have case hardening and the acetic acid being trapped inside of the bean, as well as the bean um, having a shriveled um, appearance. And this is not desirable, both from physical appearance as well as flavor-wise. Another traditional method used after drying was dancing the cocoa to polish the beans. Now polishing enhances the physical appearance of the beans because after the beans are fermented and dried you have residual mucilage or pulp around the beans and basically dancing you just add some water back to the beans and by the physical action of dancing the beans, walking through the beans with a, a drum beat to, to shuffle through the beans as a dance you polish the beans, you rub the beans together and they get a nice sheen. Why do that? Apart from enhancing physical appearance, we have found that beans that are polished actually store better. Uh, they don't get surface mold as quickly because sometimes there are microscopic cracks in the tester of the bean and by polishing back the bean, you actually seal the surface of the tester and these beans store better. Now, also what they used to do long ago was add some lime juice into this whole mixture of water. Why? What, what we found is that this lime juice actually makes the surface of the bean slightly more acid, so mold um, took a longer time to grow. The tools that are used when cocoa is fermented and dried are usually or have traditionally been made out of cedar. Now, you may ask why cedar? Cedar actually offers a unique, um, how to put it, combination of strength as well as lightness. And it doesn't splinter. So the, the worker's hands are not, are not damaged by using cedar. And it's also very durable. Um, so that's why the, the fermentation boxes are made out of cedar. And also cedar is not a very resinous wood like pine. So these won't impart any flavors or, or flavors to the beans during fermentation. So we start off with a genetic flavor potential that is expressed via the fermentation process. Uh, so, so this is where you have the aroma precursors being formed and drying continues these reactions and they reach a certain point and roasting really completes these reactions where you have the aromatic profile of the cocoa bean fully expressed. Today, scientists are discovering that chocolate, and in particular, dark chocolate, has many health benefits. Rich in flavonoids and antioxidants, it can improve cardiovascular health, lower cholesterol, and even improve your memory. These are great reasons to keep growing cocoa. The efforts in science research, as well as the agricultural sector, 
are focused on making cocoa a sustainable industry. Various agencies like the Ministry of Agriculture, Land and Marine Resources, the Cocoa and Coffee Board, the Agricultural Society and the Agricultural Development Bank are focused on this. We cannot con continue to produce beans to export. We want to get involved in value-added industries downstream or what we can call diversification of the cocoa industry. So we can engage. We can also look at agro-tourism encourage people to visit the cocoa farms because a lot of people when they eat chocolates they don't realize where it comes from so there, there, there's a lot of potential but we need to identify that have investors and invest in it but the first thing is for us to make chocolates the the, the science and technology will show farmers how they can blend and maybe we can produce our own chocolates in cedrus we still are in the mode where we produce and export the raw material. We should be looking at value added. There's great potential for this. And my advice to cocoa growers would be not to get out of cocoa production. Continue, because I think in the very near future, cocoa will soon be, if not king, certainly prince again.